much, uh, I would say. Um, my name is Patricia Nobel. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of the European Union Studies Centre here at the Graduate Centre of the City University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, evening's commemoration of the defeat of European fascism. Uh, we, are happy, we are very proud to have on stage to be the three distinguished scholars of 20th century history. Um, Mr. Uh, Ira Katznelson, Professor Ira Katznelson of Columbia University, Stephen Kotkin of Princeton University, and Charles Mayer of Howard University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This event has had many helpers and supporters. John Torpey, Professor of the PhD Programs of uh, History and Sociology, and the Director of the French Institute for International Studies here at the Graduate Center, will moderate our panel. And the European Union Studies Center is very much indebted to him and to the French Institute for their invaluable help in putting together this outstanding event. Thank you. I also wish to thank our other co sponsors the American Council on Germany, the Leon Levy Center for Biography, and the CUNY Academy for the Humanities and Sciences uh, for all their support and contributions. And last but not least, a hearty thank you to the Graduate Center um, and its many supportive staff who are just making things happen. And it is now my very great honor to introduce Frank Hellman, President of the Ottoman Van Walter Foundation, a foundation established to promote diverse humanitarian issues. We are very proud to have the Foundation's general support, which has brought us all together here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Hellman. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, when I was uh, first invited to introduce this event, my thought was that I was probably invited because I'm old enough to remember the day. But after reflection, I realized it's more likely my association with Otto Walter and the Otto and Fred Walter Foundation, which, as you may have noticed, is a sponsor of the event, proving once again that it's not what you know until you know. <laughs> Seven years ago this Friday, on May 8, 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allies unconditionally. The event marked not only the end of the Second World War in Europe, but also the end of a regime which had inflicted untold suffering on the peoples of Europe. For Otto Walter, it presented an opportunity Although the Nazis had first denied him the ability to practice his chosen profession and then driven him with his family from his native land, Otto never looked back. As soon as possible after the end of the war, he set out to reestablish his contacts in Germany with two objectives. The first was to generate business for his accounting firm. The second, and by far the most significant one, was to ensure that the nation of his birth and the nation of his adoption should never again go to war against each other. For his efforts in this last leader and the second cause, he was honored by both nations. Today, Germany's relations with its European neighbors and with the United States are cordial, occasionally even friendly. We do not always agree, but the prospect of settling such conflicts militarily is not only not considered, it's inconceivable. Thanks to the efforts who dreamed, as Otto did, of peace among peoples. We live in a world in which the nations of Europe and North America are at peace with each other. And institutions such as the European Union Studies Center, which Otto supported during his lifetime, contribute to, the, to making that peace lasting for generations to come. 
Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is John Torpy. Uh, as it's been mentioned, I'm a professor in the PhD programs in sociology and history and director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here at the Graduate Center. Uh, I want to thank, before we get started, uh, Patricia Nove, Dr. Patricia Nove, for her incredible efforts really to make this happen, and the Otto and Fran Walter Foundation for their support. We're gathered this evening to commemorate the defeat 70 years ago of European fascism, a great scourge in human affairs that brought on terrible wars, wars and genocides, destroyed millions of innocent lives, and redrew the map of Europe. Yet it also led to new political and economic arrangements that have undergirded decades of peace and prosperity. The defeat of European fascism was followed by the division of Europe into two blocks, divided by the so-called Iron Curtain and the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Western Europe, as well as the continuation of policies associated with the New Deal that helped transform American life. We've assembled a group of distinguished scholars, as Patrizia has already mentioned, uh, distinguished historians, really, of the, especially the middle decades of the 20th century in order to address these developments, which have so profoundly shaped the world in which we live. So let me introduce them to you in greater detail now. First, to my immediate left, uh, Ira Katznelson is an Americanist whose work has straddled comparative politics and political theory, uh, as well as political and social history. He returned to Columbia in 1994, uh, having been an assistant and then associate professor from 1969 to 1974. In the interim, he taught at the University of Chicago, chairing its Department of Political Science from 1979 until 1982, and in the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research, where he was dean from 1983 to 1989. He was president of the American uh, Political Science Association for 2005-2006. Previously, he served as president of the Social Science History Association and chair of the Russell Sage Foundation uh, Board of Trustees. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. His most recent books are Fear Itself, The New Deal, and the Origins of Our Time, for which he was awarded the Bancroft Prize in 2014, Liberal Beginnings, Making a Republic for the Moderns with Andreas Kalivas, and When Affirmative Action Was White, An Untold History of Racial Inequality in 20th Century America. He's currently completing a book called Liberal Reason, a collection of his essays on the character of modern social knowledge. In addition to his scholarly activities, Professor Katz Nelson is currently president of the Social Science Research Council. Next, let me introduce Stephen Kotkin uh, on the outside in the other direction. Uh, Stephen Kotkin has been teaching since 1989 in the History Department at Princeton, where he holds a joint appointment in the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. He's also a research scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Professor Kotkin established the Princeton History Department's Global History Initiative and teaches the graduate seminar on global history since the 1850s. He served on the core editorial committee of the journal World Politics, the flagship journal in comparative politics. He founded and co-edited a book series on Northeast Asia that has published six volumes. From 2003 until 2007, he was a member and then chair of the editorial board at Princeton University Press. From 1996 until 2009, he directed Princeton's program in Russia, Russian and Eurasian Studies. He's been vice dean of the Woodrow Wilson School and acting director of the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Currently serves as acting director of what is now Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at Princeton. His latest book, Stalin, Volume 1, Paradoxes of Power, published by Penguin in 2014, was just a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in biography. And finally, in the middle, Charles Mayer is the Leverett Saltonstall Professor of History at Harvard University. 
From 1991 to mid-2002, he was Crook uh, Foundation Professor of European Studies and served during 1994 to 2001 as director of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies at Harvard. Together with Professor Sven Becker, he directs the Weatherhead Inst Initiative on Global History, a program that funds student research and postdoctoral exchanges and holds on an ongoing seminar on topics that span different world regions. Mayer has held fellowships with the National Endowment for the Humanities, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the, jo the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, when he was concurrently a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, Center for Scholars. In 2003, he was a recipient of an Alexander von Humboldt uh, research Prize. His many influential pro publications include Among Empires, <coughs> excuse me, Among Empires, American Ascendancy and Its Predecessors by Harvard University Press in 2006, The Shock of the Global, the 1970s in Perspective, Harvard University Press 2010, and Leviathan 2.0, Inventing Modern Statehood, once again, Harvard University Press. 2014. So needless to say, we have a very distinguished uh, group of scholars here who are extremely knowledgeable about this part of uh, recent history. And I have a number of questions that I want to ask them uh, to respond to. Basically, the idea was to have Professor Katznelson talk about these, uh, uh, this past from a, the point of view of the United States. Professor Mayer to talk from the point of view of, of what was going on in Western Europe, and Professor Kotkin to talk about uh, the perspective of the, from the Soviet Union. So the first question is a fairly simple and straightforward one. Um, what was the significance of the defeat of Europe, European fascism for the United States, for Western Europe, and for the Soviet Union? And I think Professor Mayer is going to go first. Uh, I think the first thing we have to think is, is take fascism seriously. Uh, it's, it's as a formal doctrine or movement, it's, it's, it's over. But uh, it, uh, it is fully one of the major ideological alternatives of the early 20th century. And uh, you know, obviously for Western Europe, its defeat uh, was a tremendous uh, liberation, not least for those living in the fascist regimes. I include Nazi Germany as, as, as a major one. Uh, that's sometimes uh, debated. They did overlap, certainly. Uh, and it had serious intellectual roots. Uh, it had mo mo French and Italian, as well as German, some national syndicalism, a, a distrust of parliaments, uh, a belief in, in the regenerative capacity, the health, uh, hygiene of violence, racist ideology. It drew on the inherent authoritarianism of uh, of colonialism and the First World War had made its lessons really plausible. The First World War seemed to indicate that parliaments were talk shops uh, and could not take, uh, run a serious nationalist enterprise and it took men from the trenches and military leaders and uh, decisive uh, people to run, run government. Uh, and it, it, it inculcated sometimes a contempt for life. And the remedy of the arrival of mass politics in the early 20th century, especially in Europe, social democracy, uh, later uh, communism as well, made its remedies seem salutary uh, for, for many. Uh, I, on my first course when I was teaching in 1967 was a seminar on fascist movements and Right. And I remember talking with a great political scientist, uh, Dieter Schlar, about this, and she said, there's, there's nothing serious about it. You can't read. None of these ideas have any seriousness. But I do think the ideas were serious. They're not ideas, uh, the ideas of authority and, and, uh, and, and leadership and uh, military virtues. Uh, and they, they remained serious. Happily, the Second World War eliminated uh, fascism in Europe. Uh, as a real political alternative. We have some disquieting, and uh, we'll come back to that maybe, you know, movements and tendencies uh, in, in, in Europe today, which are uh, in some sense drawn the same emotions and spirits, but at the moment there is no fascist regime in, in view. Uh, and it, for Western Europe, the defeat of fascism restored representative government, parliamentary government, is a plausible alternative. 
It gave the European left a claim on government by virtue of its activity in the resistance. Uh, and the question, uh, so I think this is a, you know, it is, a, it is a memorable, it is a memorable occasion. I think Americans, uh, are, as a matter of fact, he said he remembered VE Day. I remember it as a six-year-old VJ Day, and to many Americans, VJ Day was the really end of the war. I mean, after all, there were millions of men set to go to, across the Pacific uh, to, to invade Japan. Uh, but the, uh, the end of the fascist war was, uh, you know, it was, it was really significant, and obviously the Europeans understood that, the British and others, as, 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 their, as their central war. So, good thing it was defeated, taken, to be taken seriously, uh, and to be, and to, to look, and to, its ideas, for better or worse, also to be taken seriously. Happy the the, this monumental moment of the defeat of, uh, of the fascist axis um, and the triumph of the United States and its allies, including the Soviet Union, which come back to this ironic, um, uh, complicated alliance. Um, this moment should remind us, though, that um, if we were to go back just about 10, 15 years before the end of the Second World War, we would have discovered that although um, the Nazi movement was um, widely loathed and feared in the United States, the Italian fascist movement had rather different standing. Um, uh, Breckinridge Long, the U.S. ambassador um, at the beginning of the Roosevelt administration, adored Mussolini. Um, one of his predecessors wrote the preface to Mussolini's autobiography published in English in 1928. Uh, Charles Merriam, great political scientist and uh, first president of the Social Science Research Council, celebrated um, the regime for its, quote, experimental nature, anti-dogmatic temper, and moral élan. Um, uh, quite extraordinary. Um, and it was only when um, Mussolini, not even the Ethiopian uh, Abyssinian campaign, um, uh, made that regime um, the enemy. Um, indeed, in 1936, the Roosevelt administration sent a study group to Rome to discern how to more efficiently run the executive branch of government. It was only after 38, um, when the, the bonding with Nazism became close, and then, of course, with the Second War itself, that fascism, Nazism, fascism, became a unitary category. And one question I have, which I hope we'll come back to, is whether or not what this panel or this event is calling the defeat of fascism was the defeat of Nazism or the defeat of fascism. Um, there was a sense in which soft versions of authoritarianism in a plethora of ways, think of Peronism as a uh, 1946, Juan Perón is elected president of uh, Argentina. Um, whether or not a, a, a plethora of types of, if not capital F fascist, but um, uh, authoritarian, force-centered, and anti-parliamentary, which is, I think, critical, um, regimes, not only survived the war, um, but became um, in a context where um, dirty hands, as it were, were necessary to fight the Stalinist um, uh, totalitarian um, uh, option, became allies um, to the liberal West. So I think there's a complicated, I'm raising questions about the very title of the defeat, a singular defeat of uh, fascism. For the United States and for the world, I, here I echo uh, Charlie Mayer, the, I think the great triumph um, was a demonstration that a government, a regime, a democracy that was a representative, in a sense, parliamentary democracy, ours is Congress, uh, could in fact confront and address the big problems of the day. This was exactly what um, uh, not just the fascist critics, um, but the Bolshevik critics, 
um, had said about liberal democracy that the great flaw was their uh, parliamentary um, uh, design, which um, defeats ideas of public interest that are big, which divides the people into polarized categories, which allows moneyed interests to have undue influence in politics, and which paralyzes regimes so they can't solve the big problems of the time. The New Deal, not just in the 30s, but during the Second World War, um, I have to say a period throughout in which um, uh, the US Congress often said no to Franklin Roosevelt. It did so with court packing. It did so in dismantling during the war many New Deal agencies um, and the like. Uh, there was no simple New Deal dictatorship. This complex separation of powers regime could mobilize a, a, a fantastic um, military, social, economic, political effort, ideological effort um, to help lead the world uh, to defeat um, the anti, an anti-parliamentary force and thereby show that liberal parliamentary democracy could in fact not only win but govern. Final thing I want to say by way of um, this introductory question about its effects concerns something that might be called the long-term effects of that victory, Iro some, somewhat ironic long-term effects of the victory on American life and politics. The United States emerged from this war with two lessons learned. First, that a kind of thick, complicated, messy, procedural democracy could galvanize to solve the biggest problems of the day, including how to defeat Hitler, how to defeat Japan, uh, Italy, and so on. But the second lesson learned, which was a simultaneous lesson learned, was that what I like to call a crusading state could be created, one that was very thick and, on, and rich in a sense of strong public interest for democracy, against dictatorship, against fascism, against, against totalitarianism but very thin on procedures. So we created a two-sided American state during and after the Second World War, one that was uh, parliamentary, procedural, democratic, where outcomes to policy were always provisional and remain so, and another side in which um, very thin procedures obtain, in which the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 said that whole realm belongs only to the President of the United States. 1949, Congress votes to exempt the Central Intelligence Agency from budgetary oversight of the Congress. That is, we've created in our areas of national security a huge zone of what might be called democratic or parliamentary exceptions. And the great question, it seems to me, posed by this two-sided state um, it's not whether one is good and one is bad. Um, uh, one can argue easily that they were both, um, in their own ways, triumphs. Um, we need some kind of national security state to deal with emergencies and enemies. Um, but how does it connect to the procedural, democratic, parliamentary, more messy state? And that's a puzzle we have yet to fully figure out. So to my taste, the victory over fascism the victory over Nazism, the victory over, victory over Japanese militarism, opened an era in which simultaneously we have a triumph, a victory of parliamentary democracy and the great challenge of how to manage democratic and parliamentary exceptions um, in an era where questions of national, external and internal security have not and will not disappear. I thank the CUNY Graduate Center, John Torby, for the honor of the invitation. And I agree with the panelists that this is a momentous occasion. It's impossible to capture this war in words. 55 million deaths, World War II. There's never been a war like that before, and let's hope never again a war like that. The number may not be exact, but when you get into the, those, that scale of death, it's very hard to count accurately. 
Of the 55 million deaths, approximately half, 27 million, are likely Soviet Union deaths. Uh, no defeated power has ever suffered in a war the way the Soviets did, and of course they were on the victorious side. Probably at least a third of their GDP was destroyed. More than a thousand cities were wiped from the face of the earth that is made into rubble. 70,000 villages also wiped from the face of the earth. 25 million of the survivors were homeless, and many of those who were not homeless were living in stationary railroad cars or huts made of mud that they dug out of the ground. So this is a really big war. China is also a big part of the story, not part of our discussion today. Probably 10 to 13 million of the deaths of the 55 million are China, and of course they're also on the victorious side. And so we need to try to remember the scale of what happened. The United States, for the most part, defeated Japan in East Asia. Spectacular victory. Unbelievable military logistics and production to defeat the Japanese army in the Pacific. In the uh, European theater, the Soviet Union predominantly defeated the German land army. Uh, it was very difficult to defeat something like the German land army, especially with their allies. The Soviets were the only power capable of doing that. That didn't mean they would, but they did. The United States' contribution was significant in Europe, uh, but nothing like the Soviet contribution to the defeat of Germany. Uh, Britain's contribution is also significant, primarily because they refused to capitulate the Germans after France fell. Sometimes people underestimate this act, but it was a very significant act not to capitulate and cut a deal with Nazi Germany. So this is a big war, and this is a big commemoration. Now about the defeat of fascism. So I don't subscribe to the view that this is the defeat of fascism. There's a political nature to that construct. The defeat of fascism is a part of the legitimation of the Soviet Union. The Soviets feel that if they can explain the war in terms of the defeat of fascism, that they have earned the victory and moreover that their system is legitimized by this defeat. The costs of the victory to the Soviets were not just the destruction and the deaths during the war, but the fact that the Stalinist system was legitimized and remained in place. <coughs> the Stalinist system was evil, it killed many millions of its own people, and it would have killed many millions more people had it not been stopped in the Cold War confrontation. And so when we talk about the cost of the war, we have to talk about the fact that one of the powers that won, the Soviet power, was also an evil regime. The, the victory was a bitter victory, not only because of the destruction, the physical destruction, but also because of the persistence, the endurance of this regime. Now this regime, calling its uh, victory the defeat of fascism, as I said, is a political project. Many of the Germans who were captured by the Soviets, when they were called fascists by the Soviets, got angry. They took it as an insult. They said, we're not fascists, we're Nazis. The fascists were the Italians. This is a non-trivial point. In the same way that some of you might object, for example, to the idea of totalitarianism, the idea of equating uh, the Soviet Union, Stalin's Soviet Union, and the Nazi regime, or the Nazi and the Italian fascist regime of the Soviet Union, I object to the conflation of these powers as a kind of fascist front that was defeated. This is part of the inner war popular front movement, the attempt to get a coalition on the left against the radical right, the Popular Front was a failure. And it was a failure because the communists uh, were never interested in a legitimate Popular Front. They betrayed the Social Democrats every chance that they could get. They knifed in the back all the Social Democrats, and sometimes not in the back, but in the front. And so the failure of the Popular Front, we saw this in Spain, but not only in Spain, 
uh, is, is an important aspect of our history that we need to remember when we try to, well, sometimes we follow the Soviet and now the Russian line that the Soviet victory is a defeat of fascism. I could make further details about this statement, but Stalin never saw the popular front, the leftist popular front alignment against fascism as a serious proposition. There was a brief moment between 1935 and 1937 when the Comintern effectively had uh, signed on to the Popular Front policy, which was uh, beloved by many of the foreign communists who made up the Comintern. Uh, but it was not a policy close to Stalin's heart ever. He called the Social Democrats social fascists, and he felt the rivals on the left the social democratic rivals on the left were a greater threat than the radical right. And Stalin is partly responsible for Hitler's aggrandizement in Europe, and this we must remember. In fact, Franco created a successful popular front on the right, which is one of the reasons he was victorious in Spain, like it or not. And so this type of history, where the Soviets uh, use the catch-all phrase fascism, the victory over fascism, is a political project that we see in Russia today. In many ways, the Russians are using World War II as the central feature of their national history now. It, it's deserved. They won. It was an unbelievable victory. They defeated the Nazi land army. The sacrifices are unfathomable. At the same time, however, we have to be careful because what they're doing today in Russia is to decommunize the Soviet regime. It turns out Stalin wasn't really a communist. It turns out that he was instead just a patriot, and he defeated this evil fascism. And Stalin's murders, and Stalin's own deportations of peoples, and Stalin's many other crimes are now just things that either are played down or were necessary to defeat fascism, and were not about a communist program of social engineering and building a new world the way the fascist or the Nazi programs were in addition, as Professor Meyer pointed out. You know, so I'm a little bit hesitant to adopt this framework for all of the reasons that I've laid out. At the same time, I don't want to diminish the Soviet victory in the war. By no means do I want to diminish that, nor do I want to diminish the complicated questions of the fact that many of the Soviet inhabitants chose their own regime over the Nazi regime when given a choice by Hitler's occupying army. But that choice was a tragic one. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, both Professors Kotkin and Katz Nelson have sort of gotten into the post-war arrangements from, their perspective, from the perspective of their regions of the world. Um, but I wonder if you might say a little bit about the post-war arrangements in Europe, the Marshall Plan, the significance of uh, you know, the United States' participation in rebuilding Western Europe, the emergence of the Cold War, and you all could certainly jump in where you think that's appropriate, but I thought um, you hadn't said too much about the post-war arrangements. No, because fascism in Western Europe really ceased to exist as a political force. We had occupying forces in Germany. I think this is an important point. I mean, the, the claim of fascism, after all, was we guys know how to make war. This is, uh, the, this is uh, the way we think. We think of politics as war. It starts, uh, uh -huh. And we think of war, and not just Clausewitz, we think of war as politics. We think of politics as war. And uh, Stalinism at various points uh, did, did a similar operation and invented enemies. But the, po the, the point, I think, is that the defeat of fascism showed that these regimes, Germany and Italy particularly, uh, to a certain extent, some of the satellites, uh, Hungary, Romania, did not, could not deliver on what they said they were best at. They said our claim is we, we, are, we, we conduct wars well. And ultimately, as, as, as uh, Ira has said, you know, a messy democracy and, uh, and quite a, uh, you know, a coherent dictatorship managed to, to beat that coalition. It wasn't easy and it was a tremendous cost, but I think this is why in many ways, except for certain 
certain nostalgias and others. And uh, the, the fascist alternative was not an alternative, serious alternative in Europe. Of course, there are SS reunions, all these things we know about, but it's a mass alternative. Now, what the United States, so the United States thrust in Europe when it came about after it, we, we policed Germany along with Britain, to a lesser degree France and Western Germany. Uh, it was, uh, despite all the complaints that Nur Nuremberg was incomplete, that the West German, the judicial processes were incomplete. In, in fact, it was clear that this was a political movement whose excesses were to be punished. It was punished. Uh, and we helped set up a West German, a viable West German state, bringing in the, uh, you know, the people who came out of concentration camps or from abroad and reestablishing uh, the Germany that uh, was, was, was evoked uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, and I think, this, I think the United States is, uh, can, be, can be proud of that. I, re I remember reading this, uh, who was the radio columnist about 20 years ago, Farber, who was a really conservative man. He, he really, uh, a very conservative radio columnist in New York. But he wrote a column which moved me very much. He talked somewhere in the 60s or 70s. They wanted finally painted over a billboard on a New York building and over near West End Avenue, a Riverside Drive, saying, buy war bonds. And, he, and it was finally painted over. And he said, you know, that made me feel sad. And although I didn't share his politics, I understood you know, that this had been uh, a, a significant moment. And I think we carried that, we carried that forward. Uh, I think the Marshall Plan, uh, the Marshall Plan obviously was a significant uh, uh, initiative, not because of a huge amount of money that we, that we gave, although we gave a significant amount, not because the Europeans, uh, the Europeans did not put in their own capital, but because it showed, demonstrated a certain solidarity. Uh, this is, I think, I mean, I guess if we want to talk about ideologies, uh, I think the ideology that's at short, not ideology, but the impulse that sometimes at least uh, in shortest supply today is that of solidarity, uh, especially uh, in the United States over the last 25 years. Uh, and the United States possessed it at a certain point. It was one of the New Deal legacies. Uh, it, it had animated the social democratic position. Fascism just was a higher notion of Hierarchy. There was the solidarities were only uh, uh, among ethnic groups, among nations. It, it offered a vision of solidarity, but it was one that necessarily implied a, a conflictuality with anyone outside the group, whether it was the German folk, whether it was the Italian uh, national group, what, uh, whatever. That this uh, this was a solidarity that had to be. Uh, uh, military and directed against other people. And uh, happily, I think the United States did have a vision of solidarities which were far more in, 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 inclusive. Uh, and, uh, in that sense, I think, uh, you know, we, we have played an important role. And it's, uh, the, it's, it's up to the Europeans in a certain sense, I think, if you're looking ahead. The European Union was a response to this, although it wasn't necessary to keep Europe at peace. Germany was divided, it was sat upon. Uh, but the notion that there could be a community in Western Europe or Europe that could extend itself has been very important. It's come upon hard times in recent years, I think, but it still is a very valid uh, response, and I think it will uh, eventually pick up its, its speed again. There are two or three um, fascinating, to me, fascinating um, ironies of the, of, of the moment. I would say that Western Europe, after the war, into the 1950s, um, was remade um, in part on the model of what I would call the left wing of the American New Deal. Um, democratic, but with a, a capitalism that had planning um, elements built in, a reasonably ass assertive a democratic state, um, setting limits on and directing forms of different kinds of forms, some corporatist, some not of market capitalism. Um, uh, the kind of um, experiments that were conducted 
under the um, historians think ill-fated, um, but still, um, I think, more complicated, a National Industrial Recovery Act of the early New Deal, were models that actually were brought by the same New Dealers um, into to Germany, uh, to Western Europe, to the Marshall Plan, and so on, so that post-war social democracy in Europe, for example, looked more like the left wing of the New Deal than it looked like social democracy in the high Marxist moment, even revisionist Marxist moment of the, uh, of the early 20th century. Um, so in that sense, the United States played a very direct role of not only in creating global institutions um, within which Europe was inserted, um, but creating, affecting becoming a constitutive part of the new democratic world of Western Europe. The same moment the, in the late World War II period and early post-war period, the United States, we might recall, still had a racially segregated army. Um, it had 17 states that legally practiced Jim Crow. It had a one-party authoritarian system embedded within American democracy. And one of the great effects of the war was to increasingly make that untenable. Both because, for ideological reasons, a war against Nazism, um, which was in part a war against a form of racism, could not easily go hand in hand with um, uh, legal racism in America. Um, and the Cold War, as it began, put enormous pressures on the United States. Um, uh, to transcend this uh, deep inegalitarianism, especially because American communists, their one great ethical claim, and it was a legitimate one, was they were taking more risks, they were in, to use a communist word, the vanguard of, um, of, um, of often very courageous uh, civil rights movement. And it became very hard to confront what uh, Professor Kotkin rightly calls the evil um, features of Stalinism um, while being holding fast to um, a Jim Crow system in the United States. So the, the victory over fascism translates doubly into a, um, uh, uh, the best parts of the American New Deal era um, moving into Europe as, as well as Japan. Um, while the worst parts of the American, um, what, what Myrtle was calling the American dilemma in that period, um, were held up um, uh, uh, for um, uh, brightly, bright light shine on, on those features that made it impossible for them to simply re be reproduced um, well into the future. And that, that's a feature of the victory, of what we're calling in this session, victory over fascism, even though we have some questions about that language. Um, uh, certainly, that, a feature of that victory, which translated back into democratic transformations um, within the United States. And that, in the long run, has made the victory even more important. Did you want to add anything to that? Or? You know, so the, how, how, did the, how did the Soviet Union come out on the victorious side? Let's be honest. Uh, people didn't think the Soviets could possibly beat the Germans. Six days into the war, that is to say June 28th, 1941, um, Stalin called the Defense Commissariat, which is just a stone's throw away, requesting a report over the phone, a battle phone. And they said, we don't know. We don't, we, we've lost contact with the front. Stalin got in the car, others along with him who were in the Kremlin at the time, drove over to the defense commissariat on the embankment, five minute drive. Went up to the defense commissariat, the defense commissar office, about this size, bunch of maps all over the wall, people running in and out, Stalin ordered a report. And the guy was honest. His name was Timoshenko, Marshal Timoshenko, Simon Timoshenko. And he said the, um, the Germans are on the eastern side of Minsk. And that meant Minsk had fallen. Minsk was on the road to Moscow. 
uh, Minsk, Smolensk, Moscow. That was Napoleon's rule. And the Soviet army, the Red Army as it was called at the time, was deployed in Ukraine to stop the German advance into Ukraine because that was the disinformation that the Germans had spread of where they would have their main thrust. And instead they had their main thrust in the center, not in the south. And Stalin uh, shouted an obscenity and left, drove to his dacha and disappeared for two days. This is the origin of the Khrushchev story about how Stalin had a nervous breakdown. He didn't have a nervous breakdown. He was in his office for the first six days, uh, 16, 18, 20 hour days. But then on the 28th, when Minsk fell, it looked like the war was over. And he retreated. And they had to go out to the dacha a couple of days later and retrieve him, and bring him back to his office in the Kremlin. And I think most of your pundits thought the Soviet Union would collapse. Like a house of cards, certainly Hitler and the German military brass thought that the Soviet army wasn't up to this fight. <coughs> and yet, you know, they took Berlin. So this is a difficult problem to explain. If you use the Hitler uh, mistakes explanation, which is very popular, Hitler made many mistakes and he wasn't a great military commander, and we could go into them if you want. But the Hitler mistakes explanation doesn't give any credit to the Soviet system. You see, Hitler lost, the Soviets didn't really win. And if Hitler hadn't made the mistakes, he would have won. This is a popular view. Um, however, it's just not true. Hitler made many mistakes, but actually the Nazi land army had to be defeated. They fought to the last drop of blood. Even when the war was definitely lost, they were still fighting. Pretty spectacular. How difficult it was, two years after Stalingrad in 1943 to get to Berlin, and a tremendous number of casualties taken on that long march from Stalingrad to Berlin. So the Soviets actually, they won the war. Well, how did they win? They won because their factories outproduced the German factories. It's a very significant point. That's how the United States won the war in East Asia as well. It was a production war. And the Soviets managed, despite losing about one third of their industrial territory in the western part of the country, managed to outproduce the Germans. In fact, the Soviet tanks were higher quality tanks, not just higher in quantity but higher in quality. So it's a factory production war and the Soviets prove <coughs> capable. They prove up to the job. Now part of it is the American lend lease. The Americans are supplying many of the products that the Soviets are not very good at. And that enables the Soviets to concentrate on what they are good at. Radios, canned spam or, or food for the soldiers at the front, trucks to a certain extent. These are significant but exaggerated in their significance. It's not the radios primarily or the trucks, the vehicles. It's the Soviet tanks and the steel, the metal. Uh, that is crucial for Soviet aviation, the planes. And so that's the first part of the explanation. And the second part of the explanation is the generalship got better over time. The Soviet generals didn't really understand warfare yet, modern warfare, and they learned. <coughs> It was a painful process of learning, and there was a lot of suffering because they had to learn. You know, I learn a little bit of history. If I make some mistakes, the students just walk out of the room misinformed. <laughs> the Soviet generals make mistakes on the battlefield, and a million men are uncertain. So they learned, and the learning process was painful and difficult. Stalin also learned during the war. <coughs> A lot of the generals wrote memoirs after Stalin died, and you won't believe it, but in the generals' memoirs, it turned out Stalin was the fool, and the generals were geniuses. And it was Stalin who did the learning. This, of course, as I said, all was written, imagined, after Stalin was in the grave. But he did learn during the war, and he became a more capable leader, a more capable wartime leader, and this was significant. And so for all his crimes, uh, which are, are too great to enumerate here, he also deserves some of the credit for the war victory. The Soviet system also was good at organization, but in a Soviet way. 
which was very coercive. They had um, a tremendous amount of coercion imposed even greater during the wartime in some ways than in the peacetime, and coercion in the peacetime was uh, very significant too. But they still were able to organize. They were still able to mobilize. American society proved to be the greatest mobilization society we've ever, we've ever seen. What the Americans were able to do, not only in the war, but after the war, the space program, for example, right? As Professor Mayer and Katz Nelson have been discussing, American mobilization was surprising because everybody dismissed liberal democracy, constitutional order as capable of mobilization, but it turns out they're better at mobilization and at production than the authoritarian systems. The Soviets managed the mobilization also. And we have to also say that one of the reasons the Soviets won was because the value of life was very low. They were willing to make sacrifices that uh, democracy is just unwilling to make. They were willing to take losses that were so significant, but in many ways necessary, although not always necessary, for the battles that they engaged in. Stalingrad, Kursk, and then all the battles back, as I said, up to Berlin. Willingness to take the East European capitals, for example, which the Americans were unwilling to take because of the casualties that were potentially involved. That story is a complex story, but there's some truth to that. And so in the end, the, the fact that they lost 27 million, including 7 million soldiers, was part of the reason that they won, because they were willing to make those kind of sacrifices. So you put it all together, you get a story of Soviet victory, not predominantly Hitler's mistakes. Hitler made those mistakes, and they were significant, uh, but they were not significant enough uh, for the Soviet victory. And so the Soviets won. And they felt that they won, and Stalin felt that he won, but the system had changed in many ways. And people were looking for a different Soviet Union after World War II. They were looking for maybe a little bit more freedom, a little bit to uh, span the enslavement of the peasantry, known as collective farms, allow the kind of travel that the soldiers had undertaken in wartime, but allow that for a peacetime population. There were many different proposals sent in by people of how to reform the system in the uh, mid to late 40s. And these were all put in the drawer. Stalin dismissed all the possibilities for change. And he rebuilt the system that had been built prior to the war and that he felt the war victory had legitimized, even though it was touch and go for a while. And so the whole world shifts. No more Nazism in Germany. No more fascism in Italy, no more dictatorship in Japan. Instead, you've got parliamentary regimes, constitutional orders, rule of law, democracy, pluralism, open public sphere. It's spectacular, the changes post World War II. Decolonization, a topic we haven't really touched, the end of the British Empire, the end of the other empires, reluctantly and in many ways, nasty process but nonetheless decolonization. And I could go on. Certainly discussions between left and right about how best to organize society and what were the basics of solidarity, but acceptance of a market economy, absolutely, compared to the Soviet Union. Amelioration of capitalism, discussions of how to be fairer, how to make capitalism work better for more people, certainly but nonetheless, acceptance of the market. You got markets or private property, you got rule of law, you got decolonization, you got a whole new world because it's the predominant trend. It's no longer a trend fighting against the authoritarianism of the interwar period. These are colossal changes. And above all, you have the United States engaged permanently in managing an international order and delivering global public goods. This is also very important. That doesn't mean everything the United States did was the right thing. That doesn't mean I, I would myself validate or applaud everything the United States did in creating the international order. But certainly very different from what you get after World War I. But one country didn't shift. The Soviets. They reproduced their authoritarian system, monopoly communist party, 
state-owned and state-managed economy, censorship monopoly over the public sphere, and a form, if you will, of colonialization or colonies inside with satellites as well as the so-called Union Republics. The Soviets are not moving in a new direction that most of the rest of the world is in. They're in the same direction. And so now we have a Cold War confrontation that was unforeseen by most of the people who were alive at the time, most of the planners of the war, most of the executors of the war, most of the diplomatic corps that were thinking about the post-World War II order, did not necessarily foresee the dimensions of this confrontation. It was a surprise to many and it was a disappointment to many that this task suddenly confronted the world, that the wartime coalition was no longer in action, that instead the coalition had divided and that a large part of the world went one way and another part of the world went another way. It was hard to see at the time because communism hit China in 1949 with the victory in the Civil War by Mao and his uh, comrades. There was the Korean War, as you know, and there were other aspects that made it look like communism was on the march. But in fact, communism was now in a different game. You see, they had the answer to the German tanks, but they didn't have the answer to American, European, and Japanese freedom, nor did they have the answer to American, European, and Japanese consumer society. You know, my father worked in an embroidery factory, and he bought a house, and that was what the Soviets were up against. My father was a working class guy, and he bought a house. And the Soviets had no answer for that. They had no answer for nylon stockings, for chemical perms, for children's toys, for the whole slew of things that became the basis of post-World War II societies. The welfare state, obviously a big part of this, and obviously the Soviets factor in that. And so it's very important to understand that they won the war and they lost the peace. Now, the losing of the peace took a long time to unfold. As I say, it was, it was imperceptible to many people at the time. It looked the other way around. It looked like the United States was too weak. It looked like many people complaining the United States wasn't properly standing up to communism. It looked like communism was on the march. It looked like Western Europe could go communist. It looked like a lot of things that were misperceptions at the time. It was the other side that was out of step. Let me, let me step in, if I could. Um, I mean, I think we've now gotten, you know, a pretty good sense of what the post-war order looked like. I mean, obviously, the Cold War was the defining element until 1989 or 1990. Um, but in thinking about this background and this past, um, I mean, there have been a couple of recent developments that it seems to me sharply call into question the sort of persistence of this order. One is this recent uh, creation, basically, by the Chinese of this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which the Obama administration called a number of European and West European allies, explicitly pleaded with them you know, not to sign on, and they said, we simply can't say no. We have to join this thing. And then in the last few days, um, the Chinese and the Russians have announced that right after Russia's Victory Day, where China will be the, you know, the number one guest in attendance, the Chinese and the Russians are going to uh, conduct joint military exercises in the Mediterranean <coughs> Sea. Now, somebody commenting on this age, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank said, you know, this was a major power struggle and we're not in the era of 1945 anymore and the United States lost. And I'd really be interested right, to hear me, what you think about that. This isn't Kansas anymore. Uh, the, you know, I, if you add, it raises the question of what, what historians love to call periodization. It's our, it's our professional tick. Uh, it seems to me that what we have, that the world that fascism challenged and that in which we defeated fascism was a world that somehow has ended somewhere in the, between 1970s and 1990 or 2001, if you wish. But this is, uh, you know, one, one thing we're thinking about is that the myth of anti-fascism cemented much of the European left, as well as the Russians in their way of national liberation, uh, 
up uh, through 68, uh, and it's not it's not the, the it's not the binding myth anymore. Yeah. When we sell it, when we go, I go to conferences on World War II uh, for the last 20 years. The Holocaust and the defeat of the, you know ending the Holocaust has been in a sense the overriding image. Although obviously for uh, good reasons or not, this was not the major thrust of, of what we were fighting for in Europe or what other people cared about. But we have taken, fascism is in a sense gone as a legitimate myth in the, in the West, the Western left. Mm. And uh, otherwise I think the European Union would react more strongly to things like, such as the tendencies in Hungary for us, you know, about authoritarianism. Uh, the question of uh, the Holocaust is crucial uh, to constituting memory, in, in, in fact, in the countries that carried it out. Uh, I do a lot of work there on this uh, memorialization. And so it does seem to me that somehow we have entered a new era in which this victory has been assimilated and, you know, we are back to a different sort of uh, struggle and the question is, you know, is the United States or its institutions that we celebrate for this period really as robust as we would like to think, really as much of a paragon or model as as we would like to think? And we, are, you know, we ourselves have great doubts after Vietnam. After uh, this one lesson, I think that uh, one learned from fascism and from the Soviet Union, when it was the Soviet Union, is that these ideologies of extremism work and have legs, so to speak, when they are affiliated with states. Uh, the communist appeal throughout the interwar period was often, we have to defend the Soviet Union. It's the only place where communism has taken power. Fascism worked when there were states that incorporated it. We have, you know, the, this is, it's no accident that ISIS wants to be a state uh, as well as a caliphate. So I think we are in a very different world. And the world I think we're in, uh, the Soviet, the Russian Chinese, I don't know what you want to call it, rapprochement or common exercise, I mean, this seems to me in some senses more familiar. It's more like the 19th century, pre World War I, great power politics. Uh, I do think we are not. The United States at this point uh, is not, doesn't have a clear view. I mean, I think the Eastern Pacific, the uh, Western Pacific, I guess, is really, a, you know, a very delicate strategic point. It's delicate, clearly, uh, for potential war, escalation crises. Uh, I'm not sure we, we have a coherent strategy, and the Chinese clearly, this is, this is not, and this is this is in that sense I think an it's not an ideological power in the way it was under Mao. Clearly, it's a it's a type of uh, you know party sponsored uh, economic uh, transformatory power, and uh, the Russians can sense that it's a, a vigorous potential uh, ally. So I think the I think in a certain sense we you know history is wonderful, it's a living, uh, and. Uh, practice it and I but I think we have to realize at what point historically things move on beyond where they where they were. This is this well, let me conclude, you know, Tony Judd wrote a great book called Post War. Uh, in two thousand five he published it. It's the final major work. It is an extraordinary book in synthesizing Eastern and Western Europe. And yet, when my view of it was, in a sense, it was dominated by memory. The last chapter of it is the house of mem um, memory. Uh, it was as if all of everything that Europe had been an epilogue to this great war. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's been the case for uh, you know, that 30 years or so. That we're, you know, one, is, one has new constellations. So, uh, uh, yeah, and I think we have to come, come to terms with that. So I'm not sure where we are, but I, but I don't think we are, you know, insofar as we see the fascist impulse, the ethnicity, the, uh, the, I, the belief in, us, in inequality, fundamental human inequalities, it's in, uh, it's in the fringe parties, on the not so fringe, but the, you know, the, the reaction against 
immigration and the like, uh, those impulses are eternal. They're not instantiated in fascist parties as such, uh, uh, with few exceptions. And, but we have, this is a world that's very hard to realize. And all this great stuff about the United States, look, I, I share it, I loved it, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see that we're the, really there at this point. I mean, Congress is, parliamentarism is become, uh, you know, a, a gridlock situation. Uh, and it's, we don't know what, how to balance our allies and our friends. It's hard to know what they are. So yeah, we're in for rough water. I mean, it may be that, that that world is in a certain sense gone, but it also strikes me that the history still, I mean, Professor Kotkin already spoke to the, the significance of this history in legitimating certain things that its current rule of wants to do, for example. Um, and, you know, I think in the case of Germany, which you know so well, um, you know, this is a history that they can't forget and in a certain sense don't want to forget. Um, so, you know, there, it does play a role in oh, not people's thinking about the past and, and, and about the present. So I'm curious what you would say about, you know, I mean, it, the war took place somewhere else for Americans, so our historical relationship to it was quite different. It's, of course, these are rich and complicated questions. I may intersect this line of thought in two ways. Uh, first, to observe that um, in the United States, but not only in the United States, there's been a surprising, surprising from the perspective, say, of 1989 or 1991 with the end of communism, um, uh, a surprising degree of what might be called anxiety about liberal democracy and its capacities. Um, you really can't find a, um, uh, a democracy today, whether it be in Argentina or Mexico or India or Japan or South Africa or the United States. And by this, I mean reasonably established, either very established or reasonably well-established democracies where no one expects a coup tomorrow or an authoritarian government uh, to triumph, you find an enormous amount of um, worry, some of which echoes the language of concern of the 1920s about the capacity of liberal democracies to govern effectively by identifying and solving big problems. So Charlie, what you say about gridlock or in America is just one symptom of, of that. So from whence do these um, anxieties come? What um, it seems to me there are really a, a number of different hypotheses one could have. Um, uh, one of which simply has to, might have to do with changes to the character of problems themselves, um, issues like um, a climate, um, which have long time horizons and cross national borders, and parliamentary democracies are good at short time horizons and sticking within national borders. Or one might say that um, the anxieties of democracy come from um, uh, the imminent um, uh, problems of uh, democratic rule, the polarization, the money in politics, the provisional senses of competing public interest ideas as opposed to a unitary sense of public interest, that these above a certain threshold become pathologies and um, uh, paralyzing uh, uh, features. Or one might say that the current situation is uh, marked by the liberal democracies facing new forms of authoritarianism of which both the Chinese and Russian models are not trivial. They combine capitalism with uh, authoritarianism. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Urban in Hungary will make a speech in July of 2014 saying proudly, we are an illiberal democracy um, uh, and uh, we believe in authoritarian um, features of, of uh, proudly, not saying we're fascist, no, but um, saying we're not liberal representative Democrats in the sense that the West would like us um, to be. But this was unexpected, um, let alone the issues of the resurgence of religious zealotry in the world. So we face 
um, from within the democracies and from without, a series of challenges um, which the repertoire of language, memory, and institutions dating to this wartime, Second World War triumph, don't give us sure guidance um, about. And finally, I would say on this question, I'm, so I've been trying to ruminate myself these last few days about what I might, what might be called um, the, um, the resurgence of Peronism globally, a sense of, of when Peron was elected president, I'm no Latin Americanist, I may have this all wrong, but he was elected president, of, um, got elected multiple times in a democratic franchise. He had a party that ran for office. But it was not a, a, a liberal regime, but it was a populist regime. It made the argument that the people should be mobilized more directly in politics on behalf of some kind of collective venture to rectify a variety of inequalities. And there's a Chinese version of that today. There's a Russian version of that story today. There was a Louisiana version of it in 1930. There were Louisiana version of it. That's quite right. And there are Western European versions of it. You could see in some political parties in Scotland, in in, um, in Sweden, or in a UKIP in Britain, um, or the Le Pen's family um, outfit in France. Um, these are not capital F fascist in the strong sense of the word, but they are, they have a high family resemblance um, to the strategies of mobilization and institutions that characterize uh, Peronist populism. And I think that, I wouldn't call it quite fascism, you could, but I would, um, I see it as a, as a new form of illiberal democracy. And um, uh, I think the current contests are about um, the capacities of liberal democracies um, to effectively govern and confront illiberal democratic strains, both from within and from without. And um, I don't know how to predict where we'll be in 5, 10, or 20 years, whether the European experiment um, which is, was a great moral victory, not just a practical one, of the European Union, of even the collected uh, the currency, um, all that, whether that can hold. Um, and if it doesn't, I think we'll see a, a much greater efflorescence of um, illiberal Peron-style um, movements, both of the right and the left, without a parliamentary center holding. And in the United States, which of course is not about to have a collapse of our democracy, but we also see um, deep enough disaffections with parties, uh, elections, Congress, um, and attempts to create um, ways around it through various forms of American populism of the right and the left, a Tea Party as well as Occupy Wall Street. Um, we see a movement that tries to validate forms of deliberative democracy as distinct from parliamentary competitive democracy. And we see a kind of um, impulse toward direct um, uh, 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 voting on policy, where, such as the California model, which bypasses legislative, messy democratic politics by putting every question up to popular referendum. Um, uh, we may be entering a new age of referenda, as in the whether to stay in the EU in Great Britain. We're about that. We'll, I think, likely to have a, maybe not certain, we'll find out in two days, uh, um, a government that will put uh, European participation up for referendum with very uncertain outcomes. Um, and finally, we see, as the Scottish example shows us, um, or the Catalan or others, um, there's no certainty that the boundaries will um, will hold either in our nation states. So we're, we're entering a period of pretty profound uncertainty. And no one has yet mentioned um, atomic weapons. Um, one of the questions you told us you might pose had to do with um, periodization of the 20th century. And to me, um, the great divide in the 20th century, or a great divide, not necessarily the great divide, came with um, 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki leading into the 1949 Soviet bomb, um, which means that humankind, as Eisenhower put it in his inaugural in 1952, can never not face the problem of collective annihilation. Um, and how we control that possibility in the next quarter century is complete unknown. It's not just an Iran issue or a North Korea issue. Um, it's, it's quite impossible to imagine a world 25 or 40 years from now in which there hasn't been serious proliferation and in which non-state actors might have access as well as state actors. So we're, we're in a new world and the capacities of liberal democracy to hold in the face of all these trends is at least a greater challenge, um, potentially, as the democracies um, faced earlier in the 20th century with more um, fixed and positioned anti-democratic alternatives. We have more fluid ones. We're in a much better shape now than, than say, we were when Hitler came to power. But I, I don't know how, to, how optimistic or pessimistic to be 